I started this series because I'm a curious person. I have so many questions and I like to search out people that have the answers. So I'm just delighted to share with you a fellow YouTuber, Bernina Jeff. From his store in Grand Junction, Colorado, he has so many tips to help you get the most out of your machine. And it doesn't need to be a Bernina. We talk about his beginnings in the family garment business to how he pivoted his business during the COVID crisis. So grab your sewing and a cup of tea. And here's my interview with Bernina Jeff. I found you on YouTube about four months ago, Bernina Jeff. And I'm amazed at how many tricks and just little things that you have that have made my life easier dealing with my machine. But first, I want to start back at the beginning and just talk to you about how did you get started in quilting? Like, are you a quilter yourself or how did you get involved with the shop? Well, I basically grew up with it. Um, and when I was six years old, mom handed me a uh, seam ripper and said, take the labels out of these jackets so we can sell them. So that was back in 1965. So I've been involved in this business since, uh, you know, a long, long time. And they evolved from women's, women's right to wear into fabrics in the 70s. And then uh, in 2006, we started bringing in uh, sewing machines. So that's been my passion in the last 15 years is the sewing aspect of it with the machines. Your store's name is High Fashion? Yes, back in 65, there was a big uh, convention every year in Paris. It was called High Fashion, H-I Fashion. So we were the first discount ready-to-wear place in Grand Junction, Colorado. This is before malls and everything else. So mom and dad would buy truckloads of jackets and seawear and ladies' clothing and uh, you know pedal it down like a big box store does now. And when did you move into the repair and like the getting to know the insides of the, the machine. Um, we always had really good sewing dealers in town. So we stayed out of the sewing machine business until they all retired. So in 2006, uh, the Bernina dealership retired. So that's when I picked up that dealership and being a, you know, backyard engineer, I just love tinkering. My dad said at 12 years old, I can fix anything. You know, I can take it apart, you know, who needs a manual, just put it back together and make it work. And since then, I've just, you know, evolved that, uh, those skills and applied them towards sewing machines. And do you quilt yourself? I've quilted a block or two. My, my passion is more art. So I have done thread painting. So I've taken free motion quilting and put uh, 30 hours of thread on a project, made it look like a picture. So that's, right. that's kind of my forte. And was your mother a quilter? She was a garment sewer. She started, okay. she started two quilts and uh, she got a few blocks of them done, but she could see a garment. And that's where uh, the business really thrived is through the 70s and 80s. She was, you know, selling garment goods. And uh, I started in the business in 1983 full time. Before then, I was a CPA for five years. So I have a really good background in the uh, financial aspect of the company. And uh, so I started and she was my mentor until she, she worked in the store till she was 85. Wow. So, you know, mentored me and we, uh, we built this business from, you know, small little mom and pop shop. We had at one time 18,000 square foot store and nothing but fabric, no machines or anything. It uh, became a human resource. I became the HR person. I didn't like it. So I downsized to a little 3000 square foot store with sewing machines and eight staff instead of 25 staff. So did you get into mixing colors and fabrics together or were you always more along the supply chain? My mom and I, we would go all over the country looking for fabric. We were, if you ever seen American Pickers, we were the Mike and Frank of fabric. We would go to Dallas, we would go to New York, we would go anywhere to find fabrics to bring into our store. So that was, when you say bring in colors, bring in things, that was, you know, we've been dealing with colors and fashion Oh, I have been since the 80s. So, you know, now when you're dealing with uh, quilting goods, it's almost all done for you now. I mean, it's just a matter of what your taste is. You know, a rep comes in and you want to buy fabric lines from that particular company. You have everything from traditional to, you know, modern to, you know, 30s. So it's just a matter of what your taste is. And that's why every quilt shop is so different. 
it's a matter of personality of who owns the shop because there are literally millions of choices every season for the fabrics that you want to bring into your shop. That's just so fascinating. You must have seen so many changes in fabric designs and colors and the waves of things coming through. I can remember my mom said, I don't know how we're ever going to sell quilting cotton at $8 a yard. <laughs> I, there's just no way anybody's going to pay $8 a yard for 45 inch cotton. And now so, you would have a stampede to your door for that price. <laughs> yes, exactly. So, so do you remember those bright neon colors coming through? I think that was the late 80s and the early 90s. Was uh, that a big was, change? There was so much dye and stuff in and they were like cardboard. You know, they felt like paper. Some of those fabrics, you know, they're not. Fabrics today are so much softer, so much processed. And, you know, they're designed for the quilter to be able to use right off of the bolt. Back in the 80s and some of the 70s, the fabric was so stiff. Um, I remember come, some of the fabric coming out of Cranston, out of uh, um, United States made. And I would unpack it and my arms would actually break out from all the formaldehyde in the fabric. So, you know, I always thought, I always joked that that's, my mom lived to be 99 years old. She just passed away last year. And oh, I so always sorry. joked that, that preserved her all that uh, formaldehyde and what we were selling, you know, gave her a longer pre preservation. But uh, yeah, there was, the fabrics of today are so much better processed. They're so much better. You know, you have high-end designers. You have designers from all over every industry making fabric lines for every genre of quilter. So it, it's, it's a whole different process. I mean, I remember my mom and I back in the 80s, we'd have to go to five different vendors to find the colors that all work together to bring in a group. So when did you start working on machines? Like, was it right from the very beginning, like bringing in machines from other people to repair and service? Well, we had sewing machines in the uh, classroom when we had the, the fabric store. So I would tinker with those and make, those, make sure they would work. And I would buy parts from, you know, vendors here. Um, but in 2006 is when, you know, we became a Bernina dealership and a few years later, a baby lock dealership and a year later, a Janome dealership. And we also had handy filters and through the requirements of those dealerships, you have to go to technical school. You have to go to sales school. You have to go to business school from all those companies. So that's where we, I learned professionally, but, you know, before then I was changing gears and stuff in Bernina's, you know, just off the cuff. And then through all that experimentation, that's, and listening to customers, that's where I have figured out, you know, how to get this Regina Jeff and the, um, my other little mo motto is keep on sewing, because that's what I want the gals to do and the guys, because, you know, with the pandemic, and if you're out, many of my customers and my subscribers are three to four hours away from a dealership. And then they drive their machine in a dealership is going to be two months before they get back to it. So. I want to try to keep them sewing with what they have. Oh, you've got a great channel. You've got all sorts of good little tips and tricks. Just even in the threading of the machine, you say to hang on to that thread with your right hand to hear that click, 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 click. And I started threading my machine that way and I couldn't believe how much better <laughs> results were on a consistent basis. I also yeah. put that little clip on the back to stop the thread from jumping around my spool which is a big problem that I have all the time. Little things, I, just ingenious. I get a lot of questions from people asking about machines and I make a point not to answer them, but I think you can answer some of them. I'm going to ask you if a person is a budget conscious sewer, what should that person look for in a new machine? Well, I always start the interview process with size. Do you need size to the right of the needle? because every inch to the right of the needle will cost a thousand or two thousand dollars. So if you want a 10 inch wide machine, it's going to be eight or ten thousand dollars. So you know that's not in everybody's budget. So what I ask is how much size do you need and how thick of projects are you doing? Because you know there's brands of machines out there that sew fine through two and three and four layers of fabric, but if you start sewing bags, the buy any bags and things like that, you're sewing through zippers and you're throwing, you know, that's that's a, you know, a quilting project anymore with some of these bags. So if you're just sewing a couple of layers of fabric and you're going to have the quilt um, 
long arm bladers, then almost any machine, even some of the brother machines will do just fine. So it's just, it's just a matter of getting in front of the machine, hopefully go to a dealership or go someplace where you can actually test it with the fabrics you're gonna be using. I love the customer that comes in with the project in their hand and saying, well, this machine sew this. So I even put their thread in there and their project and have them sit down in front of the machine and see, is this performing what you expect it to do? When is the best time for someone to upgrade their machine? There's a lot of FOMO. A lot of people think that they should be getting what their the sewer next to them has. But when should somebody upgrade? Well, I wouldn't upgrade right before I go to a retreat or don't go to a class because you're going to be sitting in front of a machine that you have no idea what it's going to do. And you're going to be frustrated because everybody else is getting their project done and you're still trying to learn the machine. You know, it's like buying a new pair of hiking boots and going on a 20 mile hike. You need to break in first. So plan ahead. If you're going to go someplace special on a retreat or a class, get a machine and get trained on it for three or four months before that happens. Um, just any time you think that the machine's not performing, you don't have enough room, you don't have enough light, you can't thread the needle anymore. It's just, you know, it's just you're, you're spending more time fixing the machine than sewing it. It's time to look into a new machine or new to you. It doesn't have to be a brand new machine. There's a lot of dealers that go through trade-in machines that are wonderful values. You know, I get Berninas here that are only four or five years old and they're a third of the price of new. And like me, I stand behind a machine for 12 months. You know, if even if the uh, computer blows up within that 12 months, I'll make it right with it. I have a Bernina 910 that I bought when I was, I think I was 19. And my mother told me to buy quality. It'll last you forever. And there's still times when I prefer it over my brand new 750. <laughs> yes. And we love these, you know, they're not vintage. They're, they're just a really good you know, machine. Those, the nine series of Berninas, the 830 series are really nice machines and they're mechanical. There's nothing uh, computerized that's going to go out on them. So, you know, those, those are excellent machines. And all you need to do is flip the top and oil it. And that's where my videos come in. Then. Do you work on many featherweights? Oh yeah, I just got a white one that I purchased for myself. You know, that minty white colored one. And uh, a gal came in the store years ago and came in with a 19, well, it was a birth year of my wife's, so I had to buy it. And it's, it's in our house and our house is all decorated with uh, primitives and antiques, so it works really well. We even had on, um, February 14th, Valentine's Day, years ago, we had uh, Bring Your Featherweight. We had a whole uh, event on featherweights. And one gal in the valley had 14 of them. What's your position on uh, painting them? Is that a good thing or you don't you care? Know, I had a gal bring me a cherry red one once. Yeah. You know, it, it's just what you love. I mean, you know, they're, they're meant to sew a billion stitches, so they'll last and last and last. Can you give us a couple of tips on what we need to do to keep our machine running well? Never use canned air on your machines because canned air just blows the dust inside and really dries out the oils that are inside. So that's something I highly you know, discourage. I would just make sure that you keep the bobbin area clean. And if you have a vacuum attachment, that works great in there, you know, just dust it out. I also recommend that you change the needle after you know, every six to eight hours of sewing. When a needle gets dull, you know, it's making the machine work harder because it's not nice and sharp. Needles are only 50 cents to a dollar each and match the needle to your project. That's, that's the other thing. And I would recommend that not every six months or every year, but have your machine maintained on a regular basis, just like changing the oil in your car. If you never change the oil in your car, I had a gal bring me a, a 931 and it's made 1986. It's the first time it's ever seen a dealer. Never, it's never had, you know, she doesn't do a lot of sewing and it started, it finally after 1986, it's just finally started making some noise. So that's how well engineered that was at Bernina. So, you know, I'd recommend every, at least two to five years, bring your machine in to have it maintained professionally with a reputable service man. 
And when we bring that in for that annual servicing, what do you do? I know you clean it out, but what are the other things that you do? On the newer machines, they all have plastic covers with insides all metal frames. So we take every single cover off. Um, I text go through a few hundred Q-tips a day because they take all the old oil and the grimy stuff out. We also take it to an air compressor with 100 pounds of pressure and blow anything out that might have accumulated with the lint and the dirt and stuff out. And it's amazing after you've used that air compressor to the inside of the machine, it looks like it came from the factory again. It's just it's amazing how good it looks. And inside a machine, there might be anywhere from five to a hundred wire connections that we have to take apart and then put back in with the new modern ones. The older mechanical ones, the big deal is getting the uh, oil that has turned to varnish out. We use special solvents and stuff to get the varnished oil out and then replace it with the correct oil and the correct lubrications. So a machine can take anywhere from an hour to two and a half hours to maintain. And how often is the timing something that you need to deal with? Well, timing, it's kind of brand and model specific. Some models bounce out of time fairly easy, some don't. So it's one of those events. If you're sewing along, you hit a metal zipper and you have a pretty good sized needle and that might knock the timing off. You know your timing's off is when you turn the hand wheel or your machine and the needle hits something underneath. Always check with the new needle first before your needle might be bent just a little bit and it hits. So put a new needle in, rotate the hand wheel. If it hits underneath by the bobbin area, something's off. Or if it's just skipping, if you're sewing along and uh, the same thread and fabric has been sewing fine and all of a sudden your zigzag skips on one side, that's usually a timing issue. What is the best way to transport your machine? I hear, you know, the new electronic machines are a little bit sensitive. I think my old Bernina could handle anything, but they worry about, you know, just jostling it around. What's a good way to transport your machine? That is a very good question because I get machines in here and the, the power cord is still plugged in. They have a USB stick plugged into the side and all those things you really need to remove anything that's plugged into your machine. And you want to lower the presser foot and you want to lower the needle all the way into the press, into the plate because that lowers the take up lever, which on some of the old machines is exposed. And if that take up lever gets bumped during um, transport, it could break apart. You know, so anything that's attached to your machine, you know, make sure it's, it's uh, unplugged and wrap those up nicely and put them in a bag to the side or put them in a cover or whatever else. Um, also, if you're putting the machine in the back seat, put a seat belt around it. You have no idea if a child's gonna run in front of you and you have to slam on the brakes and that machine goes flying across the back of your machine, your trunk or anything else. So, you know, watch, just think of it being like a child. You wanna protect it. And if you have the, uh, uh, wheeled uh, carrying carts. I go to Walmart and I buy a little travel pillow and I put a travel pillow between the front of the machine and the travel case and strap that in because that pillow is going to absorb anything that might hit the knobs, it might hit the screen, that sort of thing. So I've got a lot of viewers who live miles and miles. Like you talked about people being four hours away from a dealer. How do they find I personally think the dealer is key with the machine because you develop a relationship with your dealer. You know, you yeah, want to be I, able to call them if you've got a problem. You want right. confidence that when you send it in, it's going to get repaired. And as your sh channel shows, there's all sorts of little tricks that you don't know about that you're relying on your dealer for. Mm -hmm. So what do you look for in a dealer? How far, how far away should they be? And what are good services that they offer? Well, you know, social media helps a lot right now. I mean, you might just put it out there on Facebook. You know, I live in New Hampshire. Anybody got a good dealer out there? You know, and, and you know, your friends. I mean, the, it's, it's what you just have to check with because you're not just buying a sewing machine now. You're buying the dealership because you got to buy the dealership because the, the machines, even the, you know, the older ones, they need TLC occasionally. So you want to do some checking and uh, the trouble with a lot of the brands of machines is they are so specific because you know, unless you're a Benina dealership, you can't get Benina parts. You know, I get people coming in here for 
off in Viking machines that are only a few years old, but I can't get the parts. Yeah, I can get normal things like bobbin cases and, and things like that, but I can't get a computer board. I can't get things like that. And our near, nearest Viking and Boff dealership is 300 miles away. So, you know, a lot of people have jumped ship from that brand and come to the brands that I have because they know that they can, you know, get support. And it is, it's a lot of support. Um, you just kind of have to do your research. You know, if you have a choice of going east or west, north or south, find the dealership that's been around and, you know, one or two bad marks on uh, social media is not, not a bad thing. It's almost better than seeing a perfect score, but you don't want to see 50 uh, really poor ratings and only one or two good ones. So you just, you just kind of have to feel it out. We used to be in the appliance industry, my husband and I, and our techs would go on the road. And unfortunately, the way of reviews is that it's the angry people, the dissatisfied people that lead the reviews, the, the happy ones, the ones that you save their dinner party of 100 people uh, for. They, they rarely make the reviews. The other really big issue for all sewers, why is tension so scary? <laughs> I think it's, it's a process of being educated on it. You know, it's, you were told, well, I hear it all the time. You know, I was in home ec class and I was told never to touch that dial, never to touch that screw on the bobbin case, never, never, never. And they were never explained what tension is. And, you know, lower tension, there has to be a drag on the bobbin case, you know, a little bit of a drag. And I have a video on different things that you can attach to your bobbin so you can tell if you have enough tension on it. And the upper tension needs to be between eight and 10 times that amount of tension. So as you're pushing your or threading your machine, uh, when the presser foot's up, it should be nice and smooth. And when you lower the presser foot, it should be enough to almost tweak the needle or bend the needle. That's how much upper tension there has to be on a sewing machine for it to sew correctly. So it's a matter of education. Um, I even have, maybe that'll be a good uh, video for me to do. I even have some uh, props. I took two pie tins and put them together with the spring to show how the thread has to go through them to create the proper tension. And having it in a large you know, prop, it really helps my customers here of you have to get that thread through the upper tension, otherwise it won't sell. My very first interview on this series was with a woman by the name of uh, Anita Zobins, and she used to have a thread bar workshop where you just practiced. You just sat down with uh, three layers of fabric while batting in the middle and you sewed a straight line and you played with the dial as you were sewing that line so you could see what actually happened to your thread and then she made you mark down with a, a pen. Okay, this is at plus four, this is at minus one. So you had a reference to go back to all the time. That was a really good, really good tip. How has the events of the past two years made you pivot as a dealer? Well. Exactly. The pivot was a good word because when I saw this coming, I got involved with the local hospital and I knew I had a bunch of sewing people and they provided me with special uh, splash proof material. And we were, we made 30 to 40,000 masks in a month for the hospitals and everything around the area out of this special fabric. Wow. We had um, designated areas. I had volunteers come in to cut the kits we put the kits in uh, bags of 10 with the elastic, with the uh, nose pieces and the fabric. I put a YouTube out there on uh, how to sew it. And uh, we put them out the front door. And I had a line of people waiting to grab these kits that was all the way around my parking lot. So they had two or three days to sew the kits and bring them back. So within a month, we did 30,000 masks. And then we went from just the uh, protection mask to the fabric masks. And um, being doing this, I was an um, essential place so I could stay open. And people were bringing their sewing machines that hadn't been cranked up for 20 years. And we were, I was almost doing repairs on the parking lot. I was doing on the spot. Okay, I'm gonna get you sewing. I'm gonna show you how to get your tensions right. You had your needle in backwards. Okay, you're ready to go sew masks now. And we were doing almost 200 machines a month to get them going. So it was, you know, I, we never missed a beat financially or never had to lay an employee off. Excellent. And I see that that's really when your channel, your YouTube channel started too. You've done exactly. a lot in the last year. Yep. And that, 
you know, being as though that, you know, customers couldn't come in as easy. So that's, I said, you know, there's a, there's a need out there for the, uh, the followers and subscribers to have help on their machines without having to come in. Yeah. So it was, it was perfect timing. You have a couple of items that I didn't know that were available on your website. One was the, the little, the, the needle holder, because I oh. have big meaty fingers. Um, that looks like a little, a good little device. What else do you have? You've got the, the tweezers, you got the oiler. I started oiling around the hook assembly and I can't not believe the difference in sound of my machine that that makes. Like it's exactly. really nice and purring now that I'm doing that. It needs it about every two hours of sewing, doesn't it? You can almost yeah. hear it in a while. And, and that's just the way the machine was engineered on the seven series. Um, yeah, I, I have actually a Shopify account now. So you can go to berninajeff.myshopify.com and my 14 or 18 favorite gadgets are on there. And you can just pay right there and then uh, it can be filled. And then we love chatting with our customers. I mean, I'm sending the uh, poor mailman has to come with the bucket every day now. I mean, it's we went from selling one or two items a week on you know, mailing out to 50 to 100 almost a day. So it's been a whole different challenge as far as I never thought I'd be, you know, online sale seller, but it's it's really opened up a whole nother audience for me. So have you passed your love of fabric and sewing on to other family members? No, not even my daughter wants to get into the business. She worked her way through college and and uh, my wife works at home and pays the bills and stuff. She doesn't, uh, you know, hang out at the store. But uh, my passion for this, you know, somebody once said, we need to put a USB stick in your ear and, and drain your brain so it's available for people. So this is what I'm doing with the YouTubes. Is I'm trying to record my expertise and knowledge so it can be out there for people that want to sew and keep their sewing machines running and not always have to drag it in every 10 minutes. So if people want to get a hold of you, how do they find you? Well, I have a website for my store, but it's mostly just information. Um, for ordering, uh, we take phone calls. We're even shipping to Canada now uh, at 970-256-1293. Mountain Standard Time, we open at 930. So again, we're pretty much an extra employee just handling the phones and shipping. So it's been, been a good little, you know, I'm hiring more people. And I don't know if you've seen my uh, YouTube lately, but I have a brand new invention out. I invented a product that uh, a lot of quilters love using rulers and templates. But if you have a uh, stitch regulator, you can't use that device to use the templates because it's on top. Well, I invented a way that it attaches to the bottom of a sew steady table with an extra connection. and. Uh, it just released this Monday, so it's only been out four days, and it has taken the whole nation by storm. My last YouTube picked up 14,000 views in three days. Wow! So it's it's been it's been huge, and so steady's out of Eugene, Oregon, so it's a U.S. company. It's one of the few boxes that I get in the store that says "Made in USA." You know, yeah. It just makes me feel good. So the, the stitch regulator, I know mine is like, it has a very flat foot on it and I can't use a ruler up against it. Otherwise, well, I'll damage my machine. So this attaches to the table instead. Which is to the underside of the table and the camera points upward. And then you slide your quilt over that camera and it reads the quilt motion. So it makes all your stitches regulated around ten. I'm going to go watch the video. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I'm so about Thank you no. so much for being on the show today. This has been wonderful. One day when we can travel, we can get together and have a coffee. No, I'm even thinking of doing a Bernina Jeff retreat next May in May 2022. Okay. And have people come with RVs and just come and have three or four days with Bernina Jeff and learn their machines. So I'm, okay. we're, we're organizing that as we speak. <laughs> Sounds so like a plan. What I, want, what I want to challenge from you is have your viewers or yourself send me ideas of what's really frustrating them that maybe I can do a really good YouTube video on and help them out because I just need ideas. I can fill content if I get good ideas of what they really want. You may have your inbox full very quickly. <laughs> it's a start. You know, if, if I don't know what people need, I can't provide it. And 
um, you know, be careful what you ask for. So I'm being, I may have just asked more than I can bite off, but anyway, I'll do what I can. That's great. That's absolutely fantastic. Again, thank you so much for being on the show and I'll see you next summer. <laughs> All right. Thanks. Okay. Bye. I hope you enjoyed my interview with Bernina Jeff. I don't have an RV, but I'm very interested in signing up for his boot camp next year. If you are too, be sure to sign up for his newsletter. I'll have his contact info, his YouTube channel, and of course, a link to his store in the notes below. Next up on Karen's Quilt Circle is Barbara Brackman, author of Encyclopedia of Pieced Quilt Patterns. And we are talking about one of my favorite subjects, the history of quilting. Be sure to subscribe so you'll be notified when it goes live. I have interviewed so many amazing people this past year. Check out the playlist below in case you miss one. I have been taking a mental health break, so there hasn't been a regular video for a couple of weeks. I've been getting caught up on some projects and preparing for others. I did have a Q&A on the weekend, so if you missed it, I'll leave a link to that as well. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that bell by the subscribe button so that YouTube will notify you when I make new videos. You can also find me on Facebook, Instagram, and Pinterest at Jessica to Dunn Quilts, and of course my website at JessicaToDunnQuilts.com. So take care, and I'll see you next time.